right, so Solomon, <clears throat> his dad was David. Now, the family, goodness gracious, was this a messed up household, if you ask me. Um, I mean, you've got children with multiple wives. You've got one son who, you know, has the hots for his half-sister, forces her to lay with him. Then the brother of that sister plots and kills that brother. I mean, it was just drama. Um, and that's just scratching the surface. Um, regardless, we still see Solomon who is to be king. He was not the firstborn. That's usually given to the firstborn. So why is Solomon king? Well, it's because God chose him and David also obliged. He agreed. God chose him and, and Dave, David submitted. I called him Dave like I knew him. Um, but we see this play out in two ways. Why he is king. Number one, we just discussed it. Uh, God chose Solomon and David agreed. And that is in 1 Chronicles 28, 1 through 6. David summoned all the officials of Israel to assemble at Jerusalem. The officers over the tribes, the commanders of the divisions in the service of the king, the commanders of thousands of commanders of hundreds of thousands and commanders of a hundred, and the officials in charge of all the property and livestock belonging to the king and his sons, together with the palace officials, the warriors, and all the brave fighting men. King David rose to his feet and said, Listen to me, my fellow Israelites, my people. I had it in my heart to build a house as a place of rest for the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, for the footstool of our God, and I made plans to build it. But God said to me, You are not to build a house for my name, because you are a warrior and have shed blood. Yet the Lord, the God of Israel, chose me from my whole family to be king over Israel forever. He chose Judah as leader, and from the tribe of Judah he chose my family, and from my father's sons he was pleased to make me king over all Israel. Of all my sons and the Lord has of all my sons and the Lord has given me many. He has chosen my son Solomon to sit on the throne of the kingdom of the Lord over Israel. He said to me, Solomon, your son is the one who will build my house and my courts, for I have chosen him to be my son, and I will be his father. And so we see in First Chronicles twenty two, as David is retelling of this interaction he had with God, he tells Solomon in verse nine. Behold, a son will be born to you, who shall be man, a man of rest, and I will give him rest from all his enemies on every side, for his name will be Solomon, and I will give peace and quiet to Israel in his days. So this is important that we recognize this is the promise that God is giving to Israel, and he's choosing the king who will follow through on that promise. It's going to be important because there's kind of a question we have to answer at the end. We see how Solomon achieved this, but would it have been and could it have been achieved another way? So re remember this. And number two, we see this playing off, building off of number one. Um, so God knew who Solomon was. God comes to Solomon in a dream, and he asks him, well, I'll just read the quote, ask what you wish me to give you. One, one person tried to you know, relate this to the genie in Aladdin. The problem is, is uh, this isn't the same situation at all. Uh, God appears to Solomon in a dream and says, what do you want from me? And this is Solomon's response in 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 6 through 9. And Solomon replied, you have shown great and faithful love to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in faithfulness, righteousness, and integrity. You have continued this great and faithful love for him by giving him a son to sit on his throne as it is today. Lord my God, you have now made your servant king in my father David's place, yet I am just a youth with no experience in leadership. Your servant is among your people you have chosen, a people too many to be numbered or counted. So give your servant a receptive heart to judge your people and to discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people of yours? All right, <clears throat> and so God knew full well what Solomon was going to ask for. He's all-knowing. He knows what's going to happen. But also, he knew what all the other sons of David would ask for. I think this is why it's believed so strongly that God chose Solomon, um, that he knew the type of person Solomon was, the character that he had. Um, but Solomon wasn't perfect. 
Solomon was the right man to accomplish the Lord's will, but Solomon was certainly not a perfect man. Uh, Solomon was wise, he was philosophical, he was poetic, um, and he was clearly a good architect. But we find that he did still make very difficult decisions. For one, one of his brothers kept trying to take his throne by killing him. And so what does, what does he do? He enacts corporal punishment and, and, and makes the, the decision to take his brother's life. Um, look, you can't try and kill the king. You, you, whether it's your brother or not, you can't try and kill the, the king. And so even though we see kind of a, I can't remember which side of the brain's creative, um, we see someone who might try and, f who would fit where we would think in some kind of role, but he also made difficult decisions and made corporal punishment decisions, and, you know, it, it was the right decision. You can't try and kill the king. Um, but one of the things that I was looking through is looking at Solomon's character and why God would have chosen him. Do you think that his choosing could have gone to his head? But not just, not just because God chose him, but think about what's around him. He's, he's not the oldest. There are several that would be ahead of him. And yet God's chosen him over all of his brothers. And, and, and how does Solomon respond to this? He doesn't respond to it arrogantly. What does he, what does he ask of God? And, and in your own words, what, is he, what does he request of God? Wisdom. Wisdom. To, do, to do what, though? To wait. To, and, and, and he recognizes Israel as this great nation and this incredible responsibility. And so he wants to lead them well. It doesn't go to his head in this regard. And God sees that. And it starts off really well. 1 Kings 3 begins to explain that his, his reign is, is going well. So prior to this dream with God, in which God gave Solomon discernment, um, we, we see Israel getting off to a good start. Uh, but we already begin to see Solomon's Achilles heel. And this does bring up a very interesting question concerning God's will. First, uh, first, Corinthians, first Kings 3, 1 through 3. See if you can identify the Achilles heel here. Solomon made an alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and married his daughter. He brought her to the city of David until he finished the building his palace and the temple of the Lord and the wall around Jerusalem. The people, however, will still sacrifice and at the high places because, of, because the temple had not yet been built for the name of the Lord. Solomon showed his love for the Lord by walking accordingly to statutes of his father David, except that he offered sacrifices and burned incense on the high places. All right, so 1 Kings 3.3. 3. Um, now Solomon loved the Lord, walking in his statutes of his father David, except that he was sacrificing and burning incense on the high places. There are three uh, potential interpretations of this verse. That except really, really stuck out to me, and I was wondering why, because it didn't, it didn't, it didn't go any further. Just, oh, he loved the Lord, except, you know, he did this. And then they didn't talk about it anymore. And so I called up Steve, I, I messaged one of, my, one of my professors, and I was reading commentary, and so I was just, why accept? And why does it not really tar and feather him after that? So there's, there's really three interpretations. One, either Solomon, uh, Solomon was sacrificing to idols. Um, previously, he just married a, a pagan woman from Egypt. You know, he could have been sacrificing to idols. Um, I believe it's... it's it's one of these two, but I'm leaning more strongly towards the second one, which is this, that he was using the idle places of worship to sacrifice and, and send offerings to God. So pagans would find the highest places because they felt that if the closer we can get to our gods, the more likelihood they'll see our sacrifice, hear our prayers, and you know all this other stuff. Well, he might have been repurposing this and, and still sacrificing to God, but using these altars. Um, because, like I said, the temple hadn't been built yet. Where, where was he going to do it? He could have just been repurposing these. Um, or, verse 2 into verse 3, it indicates that this is just not ideal. 
that you know it's he's sacrificing to God, but it's just not the ideal place. And so, because there's no tabernacle or there, there's no there's no temple, so it's one of those three. I think it's probably two. I think he was sacrificing to God, but on a, a pagan altar. Um, but this brings up a question, and I hope that we can discuss this about God's will. So there's no doubt that God's will is perfect. He promises what his will is going to be, which is there's going to be peace in Israel. David did a lot of conquest. David did, expanded the kingdom, and he says now there's going to be a time of peace. His will is perfect, but he uses imperfect people to accomplish it. Now, we know God's bringing peace, and he chose Solomon to be that guy. So how was peace achieved in those days? Well, we see in 1 Kings 3.1, Solomon did it by marrying women. So we also know that that's not God's created order, correct? Um, so of course God doesn't condone it, but he chooses Solomon knowing this will, this is what's going to be done to accomplish his perfect will. What, what's your take on that? Where God says, I'm going to bring peace, but then someone kind of looking in would say, but God knows that peace is going to be achieved through ways that aren't ways that he would condone. Does that, does that make sense? Bounce, bounce some things out. Marrying a bunch of pagan women, and but but God knew that's how peace was going to be achieved. But it's of His will. But so it, this, God, it's philosophical. I know. His will through you. Yeah. You know, but based on your choices, I mean, your your life could be an example of the blessings that God can give you, or example of a cautionary tale. Of what happens when you choose wrong? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's also in spite of us too yeah. that He still fulfills His. And when um, we were going over verses 1 through 3, and you were talking about Achilles, you, know, you focused on the part that I didn't focus on, because the part that I thought was his Achilles was the you know, fact that he married someone. Um, no, that, that, you're absolutely right. Because, and we, that's not the only time in the Old Testament that we see that that's not God's plan, is to marry outside of you know, the faith, I guess. I don't know what you call it back in the Old Testament, outside of the so I kind of see that more as being the issue there and whether the sacrificing of the high places was a result of him marrying someone that was influencing him mm-hmm. you know, and saying, oh, you know, it's okay, just go ahead and go to the high places where we you know, would use or whatever the case may be. Um, no, you're absolutely right. That was his Achilles heel, was the, the marrying of pagan. I, I, I didn't transition very well. I wanted... No, verse 3, I, I wanted to ex- express, I don't know, if, I didn't know if anybody was going to catch on the accept thing and go, wait a second. But, uh, but yeah, that's his Achilles heel, and we find, we're going to come back to that, and, and it comes back with a vengeance. I mean, David did the same thing, mm-hmm. and of course, you know, he had the, the wife that laughed at him, because he was dancing before the Lord or whatever, and then he had her put away. Uh, he never talked to her again on the lake after that, but... Don't laugh at me. <laughs> You can laugh with me. I'll dance so. with you. <laughs> yeah, I actually had a conversation with a friend but but yesterday. Solomon He's like, learned. you don't dance? I'm like, no, I don't I'm dance. I'm sure Solomon learned from watching his father the benefit of these alliances or what they could do for him as far as economic and political power by having these type of alliances. And, and those alliances were achieved through intermarriage. And, and I think you overstepping and not having faith in God's promises. Because we saw the same thing with Abraham and Sarah. God made them a promise. And when they didn't think God could fulfill that promise, mm-hmm. they tried making their own way. And God said, no. And that's been, and that little jaunt there has been a, a, a thorn yeah. for a long time. Oh, yeah. it, became, it became a big problem. Well, if Solomon had trusted God to fulfill mm-hmm. his promises without his own sin trying to those promises. Maybe it could have been even better. You know, God made sin or made peace come about anyway, but at what cost? I like it. 1 Kings 3.28 says, when all Israel heard about the judgment. So what's going on in 1 Kings chapter 3 is, is it transitions to the, the infamous story of the babies. You had two women who had children. 
one of the one of the women, their child died, and she took the baby of the other. They switched them. I guess babies look so much alike when they're so young. I don't know. Um, and so he does this thing of I'll just cut the cut the baby in half, and and he calls upon the emotion of the real mother who would much rather see her child live and live with uh, this psychopath than to to be cut in half. And that's how he discerned who the real mother was. But what's interesting is, in verse 28, with this judgment, it says um, that all of Israel heard about the judgment which the king handed down. They feared the king because they saw the wisdom of God was in him in administering justice. Now, it's made known that Solomon's wisdom is not his own. Now, how would they know that? It had to have at least been proclaimed or, or made clear by Solomon. So it's interesting because that we might look at Solomon and, and think, oh, he's, he's, un, he's, he's untouchable. But he's humble in his, look, this, these things that you're seeing, these gifts, these, it's not something I achieved. This is not my own wisdom. This is from God. That's why when he did these things, they noticed this is a wisdom that is beyond our own capabilities. Now, we may look at um, Solomon and think, you know, there's, there's no way we can reach that level. And, and I understand because God said no one will walk in wisdom like this after him. But does that mean that we're just doomed to be wisdomless buffoons? James 1.5. Who's got that one? No, you're good, you're good. James 1 5. It says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. So we read that, and it seems clear and cut, right? But I did a bait and switch on you. Unfair. You're, you were just a ploy, don't worry. In its entire context, we go back to verse 2. Consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Lacking in nothing. But if any one of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously and without reproach, and it will be given to you. So what if instead of going through life and, t you know, just going through life and experiencing and reacting, what if we intentionally began to go through life with the purpose of God sharpening us? Rather than being reactionary, we we're going through it intentionally. I was uh, <coughs> talking to uh, a friend the other day, because one of the things that really bothered me when I was uh, about to adopt Evelyn was that men just pretty much made it seem doom and gloom. It was like, oh, you're, you're gonna, not going to have any more sleep. That's, you know, this is... Like, they made it seem like it's just a... They made it seem like it's some burden, right? Look, I get it. You're going to lose sleep. But one of the things we were talking about was he, he is fearful of what I was really fearful of, that I, I tearfully brought before men to pray is go... I, he goes, I'm selfish. I'm afraid that when I have a kid... What's that selfishness going to show as? And so I was able to talk to him and kind of, I didn't want to do the typical thing of, well, going to suck, which is what every man was talking to me about. But I was like, listen, I was afraid the same way. I was terrified when we adopted that. And I was afraid because, be, what, because she wasn't my own flesh and blood, was I not going to connect with her? Was I not, because of my selfishness, was I going to be detached from her? But instead I told him the truth, which was, look, I'm not saying it's going to be easy to grow, but I will say this. It's not like God just rips your heart out and forces another one in. It's a process that you enjoy, that, that you see developing, that you see happening. And if you're going into it with this mindset of, I don't want to be selfish, you're going to see that process develop you and grow you, and you're going to enjoy it. And he's like, well, that makes me feel a lot better. And I'm thinking, good, because no one made me feel better. <laughs> but that's just an example. What's, what's another example of if we would instead go through life intentionally and not reactionary, that we can now 
develop wisdom and discernment through the experiences of life and not just react to it and hope maybe we grow as a person. What's, what's another way? What's another example in which we can intentionally <clears throat> learn and grow? Learn from mistakes. Learning from mistakes. Mm-hmm. I mean, Thomas Edison said uh, when creating the light bulb, I have not failed. I have found 10,000 ways that won't work. <laughs> you know? So we're learning from our mistakes. Giving things away. What's that? Giving things away. In what way? Helping people. Okay, giving of your time, in sacrificing. The, in the measure that makes a difference to you. Okay. So, James is talking about growing in, the, in, this, in these facets of life, and he talks about wisdom. I think that if we would consistently um, go to the Lord and, and ask him to help us to learn from this life and help us to discern our situations, he's not going to withhold it. But it's kind of like the prayer where they say, be careful what you pray for. And I posted this, this kind of funny prayer where he said, Lord, give me patience. We've already tried the situations to make me patient. Just give me the patience. <laughs> and, that, and that's how, what was that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it was, but, that's, but a lot of times, you know, that's kind of where we're at. And, and we can grow from those situations. God can sharpen us. God can help us to be discerning. God can help us to grow in that wisdom. But I think it's about being intentional, not reactional. Does that make sense? Um, so one of the notes that I have here is, and, and, and I don't want to sound bad against Solomon, um, God gave him wisdom. We've got to earn it. <laughs> and I think that's messed up. <laughs> Not messed up for us, but kind of messed up for Solomon because he didn't have to earn it. He, he was given wisdom, and wisdom did not rescue him from bad mistakes or empty pleasures. In fact, we have an entire book that addressed this, which is Ecclesiastes, the, the most optimistic book in the, in the Bible. If you're a pessimist, Ecclesiastes is right up your alley. And so this week, I want to encourage you to read Ecclesiastes 2. Ecclesiastes 2. He lays it out to, uh, he lays it out and he says that it was just an exercise in futility, that there, he found no purpose, he found no meaning uh, in the sin that he pursued. In verse 17, he said, I hated life. That's what he found. You know, the new, the phrase was, you know, nothing under the sun, but he just flat out says it in verse 17. He goes, I hated life. And he says, look at all this stuff I built. Look at all these things I pursued. Look at all this indulgence I, I had. And he said, I hated life. And I think that, that verse right there is a very important verse. Now, one of the questions I had as we were reading through Solomon, it's kind of the elephant in the room. And that is that in 1 Kings eleven three, Solomon had... 700 wives and 300 concubines. Now, one of the things that really bothered me was um, what, what a concubine was. You know, because in, in our day and time, what we would interpret that as would be, would be a little bit different than how they interpreted it. And so I'm sitting there thinking of Solomon with, you know, basically a slave of sorts. Um, but as I looked into it, it's not like it was great. But it wasn't a, a, a slave in that sense of you're just here for that. Um, it's like a wife, but you don't have the same uh, what's rights of the wife. For example, your children aren't, giving, aren't given the rights of the family. But, for example, let's look at Solomon. So his 300, or his 300 concubines, whenever he had a kid with them, he would lavish them with gifts, but the kids were not given... Um, rights as his wife's kids. They were basically considered like a lesser wife. Does that make sense? It was still legal. I don't like it, but it was basically a legal mistress. But they weren't given the rights of the, the sons of the wives. Is that So it's not the same thing. It's not great, but it's still not the same thing. Um, but I like how Tim Keller addressed this. He said, polyamory, as we see it in the Bible, does not align with God's created order. And if you've noticed, every single man who practiced this had a terrible time with it. If only he just had one wife, it would have been so much easier. 
And he's absolutely right. Every person who did that, you referenced Abraham, they had an awful time of it. He's absolutely right. Now, one author, when looking at Solomon's wisdom, said this, and I'm curious about what you guys think. He said, there's a great difference between worldly wisdom and godly wisdom. Godly wisdom requires constant communication with our Father, listening to his commands and acting on them. Worldly wisdom tells us to act practically and look out for number one. His premise was that God gave him wisdom, but Solomon did not help it to produce to continue to be godly wisdom. Rather, he used the wisdom to be worldly wisdom. Are you tracking with that? What, what are your thoughts on that? Do you, do you see that happening in Solomon's life, or what, what's your take? I just said our lives is a perfect example. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I, I can't imagine that each one of those 700 wives, I mean, we already knew that, that he married um, this, you know. Egyptian woman. Egyptian woman. And, uh, and so, therefore, all these other women probably aren't in line with the Lord our God, and and they're going to influence him. They're going to have that kind of chaos kind of in his mind. I mean, that 700 women already is chaos, but yeah. just their beliefs, their their panics, their distrust, their doubts, they're going to be just infiltrating him right and left. It shows his selfishness and self-centeredness. And see, I have to have a Worldly wisdom, wisdom at all. Yeah. So Nancy's wise idea. Yeah. That's his father's. Well, that interest. Well, that net. You have my interest. What? What would you call it? <laughs> what? What would she mumble? <laughs> Lay it out there, girl. An educated fool. An educated fool. <laughs> I love it. Uh. Uh, I don't know. Uh, what I would call it is but educated <laughs> fool is not bad. <laughs> Definitely would not put wisdom with that. Um, yeah, more like carnal, like carnal knowledge rather than. Yeah. And 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 so I do I do find it very interesting um, because God gave him this incredible amount of wisdom, but it also makes you kind of think, okay, well that wisdom must have been maintained. What can that wisdom change, even though God gave it to him? Uh, you know, and it, it's at least something to think about because we certainly know in our lives, if we are not actively pressing into God, remember we talked about being intentional, not reactional. Um, if we're not doing that, then are we just building up educated foolishness or are we building up godly wisdom? Could it be similar to, you know, we're all given different gifts. You know, um, you know you're given the gift of teaching, but you don't use it well. Thank you. <laughs> I'm just I'm messing with you. <laughs> but you don't use it well. I yeah. mean, would that fall into that same category? I mean, Solomon can be given wisdom, mm -hmm. but you don't. And he's not using it well. He's using it to further his own kingdom. He's using it for his own selfish gain. And 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 yet it's all playing out in, in, in God's perfect will of look, I'm still gonna I'm still gonna give Israel peace. Um, and how you know he went about it was was marrying there's too much I'm gonna yeah. Too much I'm gonna rather than the Lord and I are going to. And, and you know, but that brings up a good point because every Christian is to use discernment, correct? But not every Christian is gifted discernment. So how does that how does that play out? It it doesn't remove us from you having wisdom. It doesn't remove us from being discernment or use or being discerning. It does not make us exempt. But there are those who do seem to I guess access it a whole lot easier or, or see into something a whole lot better. Um, I know that I've, I've taken s several spiritual gifts. I've seen it play out, and I, I do think discernment is one of mine. But it happens pretty easy. But it's also something that I'm constantly thinking about, and I think it's one of those gifts that you have to sharpen. If I'm not going to use it for the kingdom of God, well, then I'm going to use it for selfish gain. And we see Solomon doing that with wisdom. I mean, world, worldly wisdom, educated foolishness, it's going to be selfish. It's going to seek our own will, our own purpose. But, you know, even um, like in, was it James 1, I'm terrible about actual scriptural references. I'll the one that we just read about wisdom? Right. You know, and before that, it lists, you know, if you, you know, this and then you'll get this 
Mm -hmm. That's kind of, there's other places where he does, you know, perseverance yep. gives you the best sort of thing. It's always a process. Uh, and we tend to want to skip that process. So even if your gift isn't discernment, that doesn't mean you can't, yeah. you develop know, it. Yeah. help to, you know, start to develop it. Exactly. Where the spirits are the same way. It's mm -hmm. a, you know, kind of a step-wise thing. It's not, yeah. hey, look, you're going to get the best thing yeah, that way. and, and as a Christian, we all start at a different starting point. Yeah, you know, those who are raised in the church have higher expectations put upon them than ones who came to Christ in their thirties. I mean, yes, yeah. and I mean the, the fruit of the spirit. Um, you might find you know one of them happens a lot easier for you, but you're you're really wrestling with love, uh, but it doesn't exempt you from it. This is the fruit, and it's singular <laughs> for a reason that. This is what the Holy Spirit is going to produce in the life of a believer. The only reason it won't is because we get in the way. And so, but some of them may become a whole lot easier, and some are going to be more difficult. But it doesn't exempt us. You're, you're absolutely right. And so Solomon married a lot of women by making treaties with other nations. He did not marry out of love. He married out of politics. And what we see is the fruit of it in First Kings fourteen or First Kings eleven four through five. When Solomon was old, his wives seduced him to follow other gods. He was not completely devoted to Yahweh his God as his father David had been. Solomon followed Ashtoreth, the goddess of Sidonians, and Milcom, the detestable idol of the Amorites. And it and it keeps it keeps going, saying you know gods that have weird names and all this stuff. He followed a lot of idols. And when why? Why did he follow them? Because his wives, well, I mean, they blame it on his wives, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> Listen. But he listened. Here, look, yes, look, don't, don't question the Bible. The Bible's, I mean, even, even what, I, there, there's a proverb. I haven't memorized it because I haven't lived it, so fortunately. But, but it said something like a man, a man would rather go die under a tree than be in a house with a contemptuous woman. Yeah, it's like the Chinese water torture. Mm -hmm. But that being said, um, he he got pulled away. Now, now with that, let's look at for a second for having one wife and doing this the right way, right? You, you could have a wife who just just gnaws at you and eats at you and and and, and pulls you away. But what about a godly wife? Well, that goes the whole other direction, does it not? She, she calls you and, and, and challenges you to step up into the role that God's called you. That's a whole diff, that's a complete game changer. Yes, a nagging wife will destroy your will to live, but a godly wife, a godly wife will help you find life in Christ, will help you to find and reach your potential that God's called you to. See, that's and, and, and that's where we're, we're, we're leading into is, he may have made these decisions by establishing these treaties, by marrying all these women, and Don brought it up um, earlier. Would God have accomplished this if he had just married one woman? He promised. And if there's one thing we know in Scripture, God will not break his promise. But we see Solomon going his own way. Mm -hmm. You know, if we, you know, or to spouses, yeah. You know, if we surround ourselves with people outside of the faith, mm -hmm. you know, then it's likely that we'll be pulled away. It's either I'm, it's either I'm a good teacher, you guys are good thinkers, because you guys are, are, are you know, exactly where I'm going. Second Corinthians six fourteen through eighteen, because you're absolutely right. Who's got that one? Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. Do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and the light? <clears throat> what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. 
I will be I will be your father. I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Almighty Lord. Now this is not just talking about dating, right? It just it says, do not be unequally yoked or mismatched with unbelievers. How 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 does that look in, in our real life? Because we're also not we're also not told to go live on a commune away from everyone. We have to interact with the world. Well, let's look at Jesus as an example. He surrounded himself. Of course, I mean, he taught his apostles, so they were him. Mm-hmm. But he surrounded himself with closest believers. Mm-hmm. But then he still went to Zacchaeus' house. Yeah. He still went out and met people where they <clears> were. <throat> but he surrounded himself with people that he could trust. Oh, okay. I, I, I looked behind you. And let me let me just tell you the smile that went on Jim's face. <laughs> no, I, but he knew that he couldn't trust that one. So, so it's kind of like, um, it, it's like this. Uh, there are people who, there are people who speak authoritatively into your life. Who are some of those people? My wife is one of them. Okay. Who, who are some people that speak authoritatively into your life? Parents. Parents? Parents. Boss. Boss. Okay. Well, to, to a degree, I mean, for your job, I get it. Ministers, the elders, um, people. So that that's where I want to, to kind of help us to understand it is... The people that we allow to speak authoritatively into our life, those are the people that you know do not be unequally yoked. But we also, as we you know, we see with Jesus, he went and spent time with sinners. We saw that with Paul. Paul was the was the, the preacher of the Gentiles. He went to the Gentiles, but they didn't influence him like Solomon. You see, he, he they did not speak authoritatively into his life, but he could live among them. This is where we find Solomon fall. And this is one of the questions that kind of came up was, when we talk about Solomon, we talk about his wisdom, but we don't ever talk about, he was pulled away. He was influenced by his, his, his foolish marriages. But you know something? We're also influenced by foolish friendships that we have allowed to speak authoritatively into our life. What do we do then? If we have allowed someone who shouldn't have that authority to speak into our life, but we've allowed them to step into that role, how do we address that? What, what are some things you think we should do? Well, it's part of that discernment. You need to get into the scriptures. And, and when, the, when they try to teach or influence you to accept something that you know not to be true, and the mm-hmm. Bible reveals itself not to be true, you need to hold true to that. And, and sacrifice your friendship if you have to, uh, to avoid that kind of influence. Yeah, I mean, you'd be surprised how quickly somebody would make that call. Um, say they say, look, if you're if you're not going this way, then I don't want to be around you. Because they, they don't want to be unequally yoked. Because they, they don't want resistance and things they want to freely do. I mean, that's the heart of a sinner, is it not? But if they choose to continue to stay there, well, now you've got an, a, an ability to speak authoritatively into their life. They've kept you around. Doesn't mean they need to speak authoritatively into yours, but you're given an opening to speak authoritatively into theirs. Does that make sense? So, in today's world, you see that played out in like the acceptance of homosexuality, mm-hmm. and, and it infiltrates the church as far as acceptance and tolerance. Or you know, you're 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 labeled being hateful and a bigot if you if you if you hold that homosexuality is a sin, when the Bible clearly defines it as a sin. Mm-hmm. And, and, and you know what? I've had, I've had several friendships with, with individuals who uh, were homosexual. And I had great conversations with them, first and foremost, and established kind of, not necessarily the parameters of the friendship, but I'm like, look, I have no grounds to condemn you. I've got my own struggles. I've talked about this from the, from the pulpit. I'm like, I can't condemn you. I go, but the Bible doesn't support what I fight, and the Bible doesn't support this. So we both are in sin. I have no room to condemn you. And I left it there. But I also wasn't going to say this is okay. I also said this isn't, this isn't, the Bible doesn't condone this. What I'm saying is I have no room to condemn you. But the Bible says it's not right in my life, it's not right in your life. And, and we actually, it started the, you know, the relationship off on a pretty honest level. And the only reason I ever had friends who left was 
which I've seen with my, my heterosexual friends, is they get a significant other and they just don't, they abandon their friends. And this person becomes the idol, the God they worship in their life. I used to be like that in middle school. Middle school, high school. As soon as I started dating, I didn't see my friends at all. I just focused everything on this person. Didn't see my friends at all. Made no sense. And they're like, dude, what are you doing? Come hang out. No, I want to I wanna spend time with her. And then what? You know, we break up and then two weeks later, I want to spend time with her. And it's just the same, same cycle. And I, I was like, Solomon, it was foolishness and it was idolatry. But having someone who can speak authoritatively into your life is not a power we just hand over. It is a power that we allow when they prove it. And I agree. Having people who are godly, that is the quality in which we allow them to speak into our life authoritatively. But for example, like my dad, he can speak into my life authoritatively in the sense of being a husband, a father, but when it comes to matters of the faith, he doesn't have that authority. But, I don't, but he also doesn't really try and implement it. But if I've got a question about being a dad, being, being a husband, you know, there's some things I'll ask him about. But when it comes to being a husband in, in a godly sense, I, I don't. So there's, there's aspects in which people kind of have some authority and people don't. But do not be unequally yoked. It matters with our friendships. It matters with our marriages. It matters in our entire life. And so, how does Solomon summarize his life? The very last two verses of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes 12, 13 through 14. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing whether it is good or evil. Pretty good conclusion. Pretty good conclusion. So what trials have you gone through that looking back you can see gave you wisdom? I know, let's start airing some, some dirty laundry. Let's not just have the preacher do it. Don't even listen to her own husband. I was listening to my baby. What trials have you gone through that, looking back, you see that you have gained wisdom? I mean, Chris, everyone here, I always hear it. I've already heard, heard that, that, so many of these stories from us. So, you know. I don't know. If you're throwing him under the bus. <laughs> I'm just messing with you. I'm, it's kind of a, it's kind of an invitation to just go for it. <laughs> Yeah. But um, I remember <coughs> this last one. I can't, we had several people that would ask us, "You guys just seem so calm and not worried about this." And, yeah. You know, and or don't worry. There was that worry. There was, you know, behind there. But we knew that God, just like all the other times, would provide. It may not be in the way we wanted Him to, but we knew it would be taken care of. Yeah. Um, I would mentioned how in high school I was just infatuated with whoever I was dating and all that stuff. Um, I, I grew a little bit more out of that in, in college, but still was, a, you know, struggled with it. Um, so when Heather and I first met, um, when we would get off the phone, because it, it was a quick connection, quick, certainly infatuation. Um, so to, to keep it in line, when we got off the phone, we would say to one another, you will never take the Lord's place in my heart, and you will never be Lord over my life. And, and we would profess that to one another when we got off the phone. And instilled that from the beginning, because that was my Achilles heel. I'm looking at Solomon going, boy, I would have ended the same way he did. Even if I started off right going, Lord, give me wisdom, I would have done the same thing had I not grown. That would have been high school JR right there. And so I knew, I knew that that connection, that infatuation could lead to an idolatry of, of the person that I was going to marry. And so we nipped it, and that's how we did it. And, and it has done well since. It, it really has. So the question 
that I want to leave you with, you don't have to answer. The question I want to leave you with is, do you have something in your life such as Solomon's marriages that are taking you away from God? And that is a question that I want you to meditate on, pray on. And, um, and as we looked at Solomon's life, it led him away. And so, is this worth being pulled away from God? And maybe it's, it's for the first time asking God, what is, it the, what, is, what is the thing that's pulling me away? What is the thing that is driving me away from you? And those are, those are the difficult questions that we've got to ask. So as we close in prayer, we'll address this, and then you guys can go about your day. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for being able to, to look at these real historical people who live their life that it's recorded. And we, we are thankful, Father, for your word that it doesn't withhold any of the important information and it gives us the opportunity to learn and grow from even the mistakes of very wise individuals. Lord, we ask that you help us to see and identify the thing in our life or the things in our life that are like Solomon's marriages, the things that are pulling us away from you. What is it that is getting in the way of our growing closer to you? What is the thing that, that we have allowed to step into a place of idolatry in our heart? What are the things that are preventing us from growing closer to you? We ask that you reveal those to us through your Holy Spirit. Convict us and open our eyes that we can lay those on the altar and leave them there, allowing you to be Lord over all of our life, that you would be our Father, and that we would seek you and seek you alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.